As promised, I am back to talk a little New York Giants baseball, baseball Giants. Wow, it's been a long time since they moved to California, and my guest today is an author that wrote a book on the polo grounds and the New York Giants of those days. He is Noel Hind. He's a regular on the Comfortably Zone Network, and first time on television, Noel, welcome. How are you? I'm fine. And uh, later on, you asked me the first time I was ever on television, and I will tell you a very funny story. But uh, thanks please for having tell me here it again. Now. Please tell it now. Let's go with the, the funny right, right okay. off the top. Okay. In, in, ten, words or, in ten words or less, uh, the first time I was ever on television was on Candid Camera. I was one of Alan Funt's victims around 1960. My sister and I were, yeah, exactly. We were bowling at uh, the Westport Lanes in Westport, Connecticut, and they had one of the lanes uh, rigged with a piano wire so that any ball that she threw would go for a strike, and I was left to my own uh, erratic uh, you know, seven ten splits and uh, uh, right. gutter balls, and the occasional brilliant strike, which was then followed by an, an, another gutter ball. So, uh, uh, candid camera uh, nailed us, and uh, it was kind of fun because uh, uh, I was a celebrity not for ten minutes, but for closer to uh, three days following the show. Whoa! You know, we have a connect because the late Alan Funt had a dad who was a diamond dealer, as was my dad. And they knew each other in, um, in New York. They uh, were both members of the exclusive Diamond Club. 47th Street, Manhattan, right? 47th Street. And um, they uh, knew each other well. Uh, me growing up in the 50s, uh, that was a big, big program uh, on TV, and I might add, incredibly clever. Yes, uh, simple but clever, uh, very much so, yes. Right, and, and appealed to everybody. There was no getting around. It showed humanity, and it was a different time when we could laugh at each other. If they had something like that today, Alan Funt would be shot in the gut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and he would be sued, and, uh, yeah. Absolutely, it, absolutely. It just wouldn't, wouldn't work. Trump would get up there and say, we've got to stop Alan Funt. Yeah, exactly. He, he's ruining the country. Yeah. He ruined my first two years of presidency. Yes, exactly. It's all, it's all his fault. We, it's, it's, it's all Alan Funt's fault. And as a matter of fact, if you go back far enough, you could probably blame Alan Funt for for the Bay of Pigs. <laughs> with, with revisionist history such as it is in vogue, um, anything goes. Anything goes. Well, Let's talk about your book. You wrote it, uh, what was it, 10 years ago originally? Well, actually, uh, time flies when you're having fun, as you know, Ralph. The, uh, the original edition was written in the mid-1980s. It was published by Doubleday in, in 1988 and uh, was on the New York Times uh, Editor's Choice list for three weeks. I'm too modest to mention that, but, of course, it was. Um, and then... Um, uh, there was a paperback edition published by a university press in the 1990s. And frankly, I didn't realize there was such a great market for it until I started recently buying, uh, about two years ago, I started to buy some back copies. Uh, and it was difficult to find on eBay and Amazon, even to get used books. And I discovered that of the 10,000 first printing, a lot of them were still circulating in libraries and another bunch of them were in uh, private collections. So you actually had to buy some copies from a rare book dealer. So I thought, it's not so rare, I still own the rights. So I started to work on an expanded 
new 2019 edition. And uh, because I can't shut up, as you know, I expanded the first the first uh, edition from 370 pages to 626 pages, and uh, I now have about 150 illustrations as opposed to originally there were about 40 illustrations. So uh, it was quite an undertaking. It makes a wonderful doorstop. And uh, as you know, I've been at Sabre meetings and at the Giants ballpark in San Francisco recently, uh, signing copies and meeting a lot of guys like you and me or younger who have dads like you and me uh, who remember the team in New York. Wow. Um... What was the most interesting meetup, not just this, in all your um, going out and talking about the book, what was the most interesting meetup with a fan that you had? Um, interesting well, question the because there's, there's so many of them. Um, I was in... Uh, a lot of them take a very similar form. They look at me and they look at the book and a phenomenal number of New York Giants fans were actually from the Bronx or Brooklyn. And typically it was sort of the guy who was the youngest of five brothers um, and he just wanted to be different. The, the others were Yankee fans or Dodger fans, but this guy wanted to be a Giant fan and he still is a Giant fan. I met a couple of guys. Um, the, uh, the San Francisco club allowed me to come and visit their private club for uh, season's ticket holders. It's the only way I could get into that club. <laughs> but uh, Well, what did Groucho say about clubs that uh, want him as a member? He wouldn't want to be a member of a club that would have him. Yes, well, this, this, this is a club I would love to be a member of, so... Um, they, they, they gave me a signing, and it's located behind the scoreboard, as you probably know, in, um, in uh, what is now called Oracle Park. The baseball parks, as you know these days, uh, they change their name about as often as uh, some of the athletes change their uniforms, but going off on a in different tangent years, on that. In 20 that giant park is on its third name. It was Pac Bell originally and then AT&T, and then uh-huh. Oracle. It'll always be Pac Bell to me. Well, at least it's not Candlestick either. So uh, That's in, true. In I, it, um, just saying Candlestick, the temperature drops about five degrees. Wherever per hour. Go. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so um, if it's a, anyway, so naturally, you know, there are a couple of gentlemen there who, you know, were retired or working in business in California now, but they, they had roots in New York. Uh, and uh, sure enough, always the youngest of uh, several brothers. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Polo Grounds and the New York Giants is, is to them a wonderful memory because it's associated with, uh, you know, being a kid in, the, in a time that we at least perceive as being more carefree now than uh, uh, what, what, what today's world seems to be like. I'm going to ask you a question that could only be answered in anecdotal style. Would you say the majority of New York Giant fans followed the Giants out to San Francisco or chose the Mets? Um, interesting question. I'm not sure I have ever met, no pun intended, anyone who grew up as a Giant fan who became a Met fan. It seemed, I'm sure there are some, but... In well, I'd like to, I, I am that. I am a, a Met fan. Um, okay. Marty, um, Marty Rose uh, co-host on, uh, on, the, on the Met part of this undertaking is, well, my lifelong friend is... Uh, same thing. We became Met fans. We miss natu- National League baseball in New York so badly, and it was so difficult to follow the Giants when they moved. Um, well, now that now, now now that I think of it, I mean, I did the same thing myself. I just uh, when the uh, '62 Mets came along, 
I conned my father into letting me take a day off from school when we went to see a game the, the first week. So perhaps I spoke too soon, but it seems to me that an awful lot of Dodger fans were fury, were angry, really furious with uh, the O'Malley and with the Dodgers for leaving, and they latched on to the Met fans, to the uh, uh, to the Mets. And it seemed that the polo grounds, when the Mets were there, had more of a feel of Ebbets Field than it did if, when the Giants were there. But again, that's just my Given perception. Given all the ex Dodgers that they, um, they yeah. brought in, uh, Duke Snyder was brought in, uh, if not the first year, the second year, Gil Hodges, Don Zimmer, um, Charlie Neal. Yes. Roger Clark. Charlie Neal. Um, Charlie Neal made an error on the first play I was there of the 1963 <laughs> season. First first hit, ground ball to Charlie Neal. He was playing third that day. And um, I, I think it was a thing to come, because a uh, sign of things to come. The 63 Mets weren't really all that much better than the 62 Mets. And... Um, and the you know there's their idea of cultivating fans was to go back to those old days of Brooklyn, and unfortunately, a lot of those players left their left their skills um, in the old days. Um, and by the time they got to the Mets, they were beat up over the hill, this that and the other thing. Um, notwithstanding. I find that there are many, many Giant fans, New York Giant fans, that look for a place to go. And there's a bar in New York, maybe you can tell us about that a little bit, that um, that hosts the old New York Giant fans. Um, I think what you're talking about is the New York Giants Preservation Society. And... Um, uh, which is headed by a gentleman named Gary Mintz, whose father was a New York Giants fan. And um, the New York Giants Preservation Society, of which I am proud to be a member, one more club that I'm actually happy to be a member, and coincidentally they will have me as one. Uh, as they, an honored uh, one, I might add. I, I picked up a pin to prove it. It was given to me by one of the members in Arizona. Uh, they, they sort of have a diaspora all over the country of uh, New York Giants fans. In any case, I believe it's called Finnerty's, uh, and it's down maybe around uh, 15th Street or so, but I could be wrong on that. I do know that if anyone's interested, all you have to do is Google New York Giants Preservation Society, and you will get to their website and find out all about where their meetings are. Uh, because they, I'm hoping to attend a meeting uh, perhaps over this summer, 2019, and they always have one uh, uh, adventure out to, uh, I nearly said Shea Stadium, uh, Madoff Meadows Stadium, whatever they call it now, uh, right. where the Mets play. Right. Uh, hey, no, so, uh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, this is the week that Willie Mays, celebrates his 88th birthday. Now, if that doesn't make all of us feel long in the tooth, nothing will. And I read a very interesting fact recently that of all the 1951 Giants, the year of Bobby Thompson's shot heard around the world, the only surviving member of that team is Willie Mays. That is apparently and sadly correct. Um, Mays, of course, was very young that year. I guess he was maybe what, uh, where you could do the math, but obviously he was I in think the. He was twenty. His, for, for, I was five when I I saw him play um, in '51. As a matter of fact, I saw the Giants play. My grandfather took me to the Polo Grounds before Willie was called up. So I got to see the Giants with Bobby Thompson in center field and um, how they reconfigured after Willie was called up. Uh, Thompson went to third. Uh, Hank Thompson 
played uh, right field in the World Series when um, Don Mueller got hurt. I have these memories in my mind, uh, if not from actual memories. I was there in, when I was five. I don't remember them. The Giants was so well storied in those days that we picked up Giant fans, picked up that Bobby Thompson shot heard around the world as almost a gospel. It was a, like a history, like something written in the Bible in the Old Testament that we we go to. Because growing up a Giant fan, the Yankees were great year after year. The Dodgers were really great year after year. Giants, uh, they had a 51, they had 54. Willie was in the service for a 52 to 53. Um, it wasn't as easy to be a Giant fan, but we got used to it. We had Willie, and um, what I'd like you to do is give me some of your memories of him and um, tell me how he stands out in your mind. Well, you almost want to start with, before I get to my memories, what um, Leo DeRocher once said about him when asked how long, someone asked Leo how long he'd ever seen Willie Mays in a slump, and DeRocher said about 10 minutes. And it was, that's that's very true because Willie could kill you so many ways. Um, if he didn't get a home run, he had a high batting average mo- most years, I mean, at the top, uh, way over 300. Uh, but then he could nail you in the field. He, he was uh, incredibly graceful, had incredible range, and um, in many years when the Giants were still at the polo grounds, they had big lumbering guys in left field and right field who were home run hitters, and basically Willie was playing center field, left center, and right center. Anything that was hit anywhere out there, that was, that was his ball. But um, personal memories... I can remember going to a game with my father in at the Polo Grounds in 1957. It was against the Cardinals. We always went when we lived in Connecticut by that time. We always went to a day game when the Cardinals were in town because Stan Musial was one of my favorite players, if not my favorite players. So I got to see Willie and I got to see Musial uh, in the same game. That's a pretty that's a pretty good deal wow. right there. Yeah, exactly. And, of course, there are other Hall of Famers around. Shane Dinks was on some of those teams. Hoyt Wilhelm was on some of those teams. But I remember the Cardinals went out to an early lead in the 1957 game. I think Ken Boyer hit maybe two home runs. Giants got a couple of people on base, and Willie Mays came up. And the whole place was absolutely rocking. As it happened, in my memory, Mays struck out. But Mays was the most exciting at bat of the day with those two runners on base simply because everybody knew what he could do and everybody knew, obviously, what an exciting player he was. And the potential of that guy at the fight with one swing who could take a 4 nothing score and turn it into a 4-3 to three score. Uh, as a footnote to that, uh, now that I'm thinking about Mays, I can remember a game that was on television, New York Giants against the Dodgers. And if you recall, and I'm sure you do, the Dodgers played games in Jersey City for two years before defecting to someplace in Southern California, which will remain nameless. Anyway, Mays came up, and I forget who the Dodger pitcher was, but Mays hit a ball that just missed the left field foul pole. The pitcher then decided to pitch him outside. Mays hit a ball that just missed the right field foul pole. So I'm thinking, what's next? It's 0-2. Maybe there was another pitch in around there. But eventually, Mays hit one to center field or left center or right center. And it seemed to me that I saw Snyder retreating on it, and it went out of the ballpark. How many times have you ever seen that, a a guy who misses twice and then actually nails one? And, by the way, the game ended up one to nothing, Willie Mays. And I believe, by the way, it was the only game that the Dodgers lost 
in Jersey City. So, of course, it had to be against the Giants. Now, my memory is shabby. Wasn't Jersey City a giant farm club at one time or another? Yes, it was. Um, in the late 1940s, um, Jersey City, of course, was a different type of place. Um, they were the Jersey City Giants, and uh, through, I think, into the 19, early 1950s, it was basically the top feeder farm club for the New York team. I believe, I could be wrong on this, but Monty Irvin played there, and um, uh, a couple of other players who later made the team. It might have been Hank Thompson, who played there for a short time, although I know he was with the St. Louis Browns. Um, it was, don't forget, with the black players of the time, a lot of the farm clubs were in the south, and a lot of the northern teams, and most of the teams were northern, but the major league teams didn't want to subject um, a young African-American guy to what you would have to put up in the Carolina League. Bill White, for example, was the only black player in the uh, Carolina League for his first year in organized Baseball. I can't imagine what hell that must have been. Uh, in any oh, case, and, Francis, and Frank Robinson and Vader Pinson, what they went through in the Cincinnati organization was absolutely horrible. Jackie yeah. escaped it a little bit because um, Montreal. he was sent to Montreal, and Montreal yeah. was very liberal. And um, but a lot of these guys really, uh, it was hell to pay. And they don't, the second generation of blacks after Jackie and Larry Doby uh, don't get enough credit because they paid a horrible toll um, in, in uh, personal insults and uh, physical uh, um, altercations. It, it was uh, not easy. And what a blight on the American culture that um, this was in last century this we're not talking about you know civil war days this is we've been we've been horrible racially um and not just to the blacks uh, i'm reminded uh today on facebook that alex cora the manager of yeah Boston, i saw that he's refusing to go to the white house because um of Trump's um, handling of the the tragedy in Puerto Rico, and there's some, interesting how much uh, a, a player, a manager, uh, a sports figure, how much power they have in today's um, today's world. I think of Colin Kaepernick, how changes can be made. Um, in civil rights through sports, it's wonderful being a baseball fan. Yeah, yeah. You know, actually, not, not to go too far off from baseball, but one of the first people to grasp the power of the African American athlete was actually Malcolm X, uh, and uh, he really understood how uh, the system, shall we say, was giving a lot of financial compensation to star black athletes, but yet didn't really want to hear what they had to say. And this, of course, is how um, uh, people like Ali, even though Ali was, you know, more with uh, Elijah Muhammad, um, uh, Malcolm was, was very clever. Some of his writings go back, if, if you take a look at them, uh, address the issue of how uh, blacks were being allowed into the field, but if you said too much, uh, you were running into trouble. Mm. Um, you mentioned Bill White before, and uh, what comes to my mind is the way he was treated in St. Louis and how when he became president of the National League, he had a tremendous effect on uh, not how he was treated in St. Louis, how he was treated in spring training in St. Petersburg. And when the same giants who had moved to San Francisco were threatening to move yet again to St. Petersburg, 
Bill White, who had been a New York Giant in 1957, mm-hmm. before he went into the service and gave his job, gave way to Cepeda when they, they came out, Bill White quelched that idea of the Giants moving to San Francisco because he realized, he knew how St. Petersburg um, treated, he was there, how um, they separated the players from their hotels. Um, You had people like Flood and Bob Gibson and these guys going across the tracks to a boarding house to stay in spring training because where they trained in St. Petersburg um, would not give in to equality. Mm-hmm. Um, baseball's come a long way, and I we're stressed for time. So I just you were talking about Malcolm X. I just want to say that when when Martin Luther King was called once the father or the grandfather of the civil rights movement, he corrected the interviewer and he said the grandfather, the father of the civil rights movement, was Jackie Robinson, without whom we would have been set back 20, 30 years. So baseball has a terrific effect on uh, the world. I'm just going to ask you, is life a microcosm of baseball, or is baseball a microcosm of life? Um, I think that one is a little I stumped you there, didn't I? (laughs) Uh, you, only for a second. Uh, I can talk even without having an opinion, uh, as you probably know, which is why you keep, keep inviting me back. I keep but, having it, you back. Just talk. It makes my job a pleasure to listen to you. Yeah, you just throw the throw the bait out there and I take it. But uh, I, can I draw a, an analogy? The analogy is holding up sure. a mirror, holding up a mirror to a mirror, uh, and they, they both start reflecting each other. And I think life and baseball are very much like that. But I cannot think of anything historically, let's say in the last 175 years, that has happened to the United States that did not also get reflected by Major League Baseball. The westward expansion, the civil rights movement, the depression, everything. Baseball is, uh, I guess, things happen to the country, and then baseball reflects them. But you make a very, very valid point that baseball attempted to integrate more fully before the country really did. Robinson's first year, if I recall, was uh, was it 47 or 48? I always forget it. It was 47. 47. And, of course, the Civil Rights Act didn't pass until 1964, and in some places we're still kind of struggling with it uh, in the United States. So one could say that baseball made the attempt to correct the abuses and to have a more level playing field, if I can continue the metaphor, before the country really did. Um, But, again, the acceptance of, let's say, white fans for a guy like Willie Mays or for... Jackie Robinson um, led the way. I mean, you guys like you and I grew up thinking, why the hell can't any guy play in the uh, major league? This is ridiculous. Whereas uh, that's because we grew up in the north. If we had grown up well, in the yeah. south, it would have been a totally different mindset. No, we're up against it with time. This is television, not podcast radio. So I will suggest to you that you are going to come back on a most regular basis, and we are going to make this part one. And um, before we go, I want to know where a fan can get the revised edition of your book. And some fans might want one autographed. Well, arrangements for that? Um, Sure, I would love to do that. First of all, you can get one on Amazon, or you can get a digital edition on Amazon um, just by going to Amazon and Googly, Googly, Google my name, N-O-E-L, last name H-Y-N-D, and then Giants or Giants of the Polo Grounds, 
that will take you to the website. There is, by the way, going to be an audio edition, which is going to be uh, out by the end of the summer. Or if you would like to get a signed edition, um, you contact me, Kara, the publisher. It's a long uh, uh, email address, but it is redcattailspublishing at gmail.com, R-E-D dot C-A-T, tales, T-A-L-E-S dot publishing at gmail.com. Since we're on a podcast, I know people can reverse, can edge back and write that down. So thank you for asking. Uh, The book is doing nicely and um, still trying to get it into stores. And uh, uh, I know they're going to be selling it. It looks like they're going to be selling it at Oracle Park also probably within uh, the next month in the dugout store. So that is the answer. I want to pay a little homage to San Francisco Giants, to the San Francisco Giants, because they keep the tradition of the New York Giants alive Wonderfully, much better than, say, the um, City Field, which is basically the Ebbets Field, <laughs> re- reincarnated. Um, don't get, don't they, get me going. You're absolutely right. Right. They don't pay pay anything to the New York Giants. Um, no. But the San Francisco Giants, if anybody has gone out to this beautiful gem, uh, we talk about the polar grounds, and it's the cathedral that we worship at. The one out in San Francisco is absolutely beautiful inside and out, and they have a wall dedicated to our giants of New York that is spectacular. Um, and as long as we're doing this, um, the man that made it all possible, Peter McGowan, uh, late owner of the Giants who passed away very recently. Mm-hmm. Just say rest in peace to that man because um, without him, the Giants would be in Timbuktu. And he has always kept the spirit of New York baseball alive in San Francisco. So, um, hey, thank you, Noel. This is uh, terrific as usual. Um, I come away feeling like I'm 10 years old again. Uh, the, <laughs> memories, the, the memories that we evoke in each other, um, for each other, uh, it's, it's my fountain of youth. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate that because uh, I always think, gosh, what are we going to talk about for 45 minutes or whatever it is? And the next thing I know, we're out of time. So this is kind of Ab- like absolutely um, sitting in a bar so at 155th many, Street. Some, right, exactly. Coogan's Bluff. Be well, my friend, and come back soon. Thank you, Ralph. Thanks for the invite, and always a pleasure. I will see you soon. Take care. All right, and thank you for listening, everybody. I'll be back at you before you know it. Adios.